So, uh, and I, I count a quorum. So let's come to order. Um, as Lori Bebo would say, Happy New Year. Um, first day of a, <laughs> thank you, Lori. First day of a brand new fiscal year. Um, first day also of a brand new superintendent. And um, we welcome you, Brian. And I know we have um, agenda item 3.1 reserved to put you in the spotlight. But um, I just wanted to uh, thank you so much for doing this. And um, also to applaud your willingness to jump in at the, at the deep end and um, on your very first day. And also uh, to try to use time as, um, as a lever and a force multiplier for once, instead of something we're trying to race against, um, that I think really helps. This, as I believe you are all aware, is a special board meeting to discuss the reopening of schools. We're not doing uh, the kind of normal board business that you would expect, which would include board orders and minutes, consent agenda, all of that sort of thing. Um, the intention is to focus it very tightly on certain issues that are already quite plain and um, possible actions for the board to take in order to ease what is already shaping up to be uh, an exceptionally difficult um, summer preparing for the reopening of schools in the environment of, of COVID-19. Um, if closing them and then arranging learning was hard, I think this will involve perhaps an even greater degree of complexity. So um, again, thank you, Brian. Um, and welcome to all of you who are joining us. Uh, very happy that you're here. Um, as a special meeting, and um, because it is very important that we hear from the public, I, I, I would like again to underscore that we're, um, this time we are focused on the reopening of schools. And I know that there are plenty of public comments just related to that aspect of what we're going to do. Um, other issues, what I would invite board members and members of the public to do is to save those for item six, which is future agenda items that when we return to our regular, regularly scheduled board meetings on the 15th of July, we'll resume our 360 degree um, tour of the horizon. But for, um, uh, and for agenda item six, I know, um, already that Marilyn, uh, I'll be giving you the floor, and um, uh, Lindy, I'm not sure if you might have something as well, um, and anyone else, of course, who, who might have something. So, um, 2.2, public comments related to the reopening of schools in August. Um, and I... I Part of the reason why I'd like to front load the public comments is because it's very difficult in Zoom to, um, to see what's going on um, during the debates. So uh, members of the public, if you have a comment regarding the reopening of school, um, I invite you please just to speak up. Scott, this is Rick Keen calling from Callis. Rick, hi. Yeah. I, I mean, I actually think that uh, reopening of schools is is probably important that we do do with with very cautious effort. I think we should be using all PPE, including mass students and staff, and and possibly doing much like the state will probably be doing, but you know, having alternating days with kids where they're there, so you can actually have social distancing. And I know some of the initial you know, research is showing that kids aren't as susceptible to this, but, you know, this virus has been around for six months and we, you know, the risk of bringing that back into the communities at large and into families and, you know, is 
if if that there's potential to really you know feed an explosion because of this concentration in the schools. So, I mean, I think we do this with caution and we do it with very careful separation. You know, that would that would be my opinion. Uh, the other thing I want to comment on is the COVID coordinator position. Why are we even thinking of spending ninety thousand dollars on a position like this? AOE should be already, and they are. I know because I'm part of the Emergency Operations Center for the state. They're represented there. They're working with Department of Health on this. That direction should really be coming from that level, and at the you know the superintendent and the you know our senior staff there should be handling this. That you know it's more of an execution at this end. And right now, I mean, we are hundreds of millions of dollars in arrears in the state because of drop revenue. That would be an incredible waste of revenue right now, especially when you look at the condition of our SPED, you know, we, the special ed and all, of, we need that money elsewhere and we need those positions. You know, I, am, I think that is ludicrous that we're even thinking of adding a coordinator to that. I think it's just a redundant position. They have no deal of authority. So, uh, you know, uh, they're not going to be able to really advise or coordinate above, um, you know, I mean, they won't be able to advise on policy. That's coming from above. So anyway, I'd be real interested in hearing what other people say about that. Very good. Thank you, Rick. And, and um, we're Take a note, at this point, we're not going to respond, but we'll use what you've said to inform our discussion when we get to that item under the agenda. Um, That's fine. I bring it up now because I didn't know if I was going to be able to comment on it at that point. Yeah, um, uh, that's exactly what I'm hoping um, all members of the public will do, because um, as I say, uh, I would never have known that you had something to say because you're on the phone. So. Um, it's it's difficult to it's not like being in person and and having the public participate in debates you know as they're unfolding um thank, thank you rick uh any other members of the public um who uh have something to say about reopening schools yes hi uh scott and the board this is david lawrence from middlesex romney and um I'm sure you're all very much aware of this, but I'm just making, sh you know, making sure that it goes into the record too, as far as a uh, consideration, which I, I will emphasize again, I have no doubt you are already taking into consideration, but as one of the families that is very confident that even if you have in-person schooling, we will almost certainly not be sending our children back. Um, I, I, I don't envy you're trying to figure this out, but I, you know, uh, one of the things you're going to have to take into consideration is that there is a, I don't know what the numbers are, but I'm sure it's a non-trivial subset of families that will not be willing to send their children back into classrooms, no matter what precautions are being taken. So um, I, I do not envy your challenge um, and good luck. Thank you very much, David. Um, and uh, again, um, point taken, appreciate that. Um, other members of the public who would like to uh, weigh in on this one or another aspect of reopening schools in August. Um, I, I know that there has been some um, email traffic on this that, that I've been copied on. And if the people, I, I don't see the people who sent it here. So, um, if I may just sort of very quickly tick off what I have seen. Um, you know, recall that Rick just referred to alternating days in order to, I guess, de-densify the school. Um, one uh, member of the public has written, don't alternate days for pre-K to six. Um, also said masks, yes, but not for kids for adults. Um, another member of the public actually responding to this said, no, masks for all, um, including kids. Um, I was wondering, just as Dave, uh, David Lawrence was talking about whether uh, about homeschooling, 
being more prominent, more prevalent, um, asking about the calendar, the school calendar, and whether it makes sense to make any changes to that to allow for deep cleaning or um, other kinds of uh, interventions. Um, also, the same person mentioned uh, wondering whether the so-called flipped classroom technique would be um, would be useful potentially. Um, and Scott, what's the flipped classroom technique? I uh, can I can I ask somebody who's more uh, one of the uh, administrators, perhaps, or um, Gillian? I, I see you smiling um, at my discomfiture. <laughs> Would you care to explain? God, I'm laughing near you, not not at you. Uh, the, the the flipped classroom concept is um, the idea that. I mean, it can be done in any number of ways, but very frequently it's a teacher delivering instruction, oftentimes over video, that then the, the students are practicing outside of the classroom. Uh, if somebody else can jump in if I'm garbling it. But it's somewhat, it's actually somewhat similar to what we did during um, remote learning. I can chime in just because I was on the email chain, and that is exactly what the member of the public mentioned. Um, but then, so the majority of reviewing the lesson, if parents had questions about the lesson, that would be done outside. But then coming, if we are doing a back-in-school model, then you'd have the hands-on in the classroom. Um, I did let the, the person know that, at least at Rumney, that was a model that that had been implemented over remote learning. That was all I think of the conversation. Great, thank you very much, Marilyn and Gillian. Chris, um, is your curiosity satisfied? Chris, it, it was David that had asked, and yes. Oh, I'm sorry, David. I, I apologize. Um, old ears. Um, very good. Okay. Um, uh, just two more small points. Um, one reference to uh, a hope that perhaps online small groups might be considered. And uh, another, actually another person supporting what Rick was talking about, um, Rick's position against uh, a new COVID-19 coordinator. Um, so, uh, uh, does anybody else, has anybody else picked up anything in the, in the email or anything to add to this? If not, um, I think we'll close public comments then and go to student reports. If we have a student here to report, um, I think Mia has already graduated and moved on. Um, Towns, I, I don't believe I see him here. So um, that would allow us then to go to 3.0 and in particular 3.1, um, new superintendent introduction. And um, so limelight, Brian, welcome and uh, wish you very successful, rewarding, fulfilling, and long live tenure here with us. Well, thank you very much, Scott. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here today. Uh, and what a great way to start my first day as superintendent in Washington Central and to have a board meeting tonight. So uh, I'm very thankful uh, that everyone could uh, come here on short notice. Uh, to uh, really start talking about the reopening of school. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a action pack, uh, a lot of the action we're asking the board to do tonight. There are some, uh, I heard some members of the public. Um, I'm gonna try to address that in my superintendent's report tonight as well. Um, and uh, again, this is just a beginning of a conversation, uh, but I think it's something that we definitely do need 
uh, to get into. But before I get into all that, uh, again, it's my pleasure to be here. I see some folks are in their house, some people are outside. Uh, so, and uh, that's a good idea, Flora. I might have to uh, think about doing that but ne next time, <laughs> sitting outside on the porch, uh, especially the beautiful Vermont weather that we've been having uh, the last few days, uh, minus the rainstorm, right? The, the come, minus yesterday, and, but, uh, and today. Uh, so anyway, uh, are we ready? I did prepare a little PowerPoint, uh, just start some talking points about me. You see some pictures of me, uh, not in a suit, which is very formal, I know, uh, but I, I definitely wanted to make sure uh, it, we set the uh, set the tone for our students. If any students are watching, you, you, you try to dress uh, uh, dress dress the part for your job. And uh, so I just wanted to uh, let. Uh, are we ready, Keith, to put up the PowerPoint? Yes, I am. Give me one second here. Yes, I am. Um, Give me one second. Okay. Okay. And uh, Keith, when uh, when I set, when I give you the little go ahead like this, you can just uh, keep the next thing going. All right. Just let me know when you're re Are we ready, Keith? Yes, I think we're all ready to go. Okay, great. So uh, uh, that, so everyone, I just want to let you know, uh, I uh, normally would have been able to talk more in person. You know, I, I feel like I'm very personable. I can be very personable. Uh, it's sometimes difficult under the Zoom meeting. So I try to, uh, you know, so it is a little formal, uh, but I'm trying to make it less formal. Uh, in my narrative of, of uh, introducing myself. So I am new uh, to uh, Vermont. I, my family and I, we've been uh, here for uh, a few months getting acclimated to Vermont. Uh, we love it here. Uh, we've had better weather the last few, last couple of days. We didn't have so much great weather, but before that we definitely did. Uh, my wife and my uh, infant daughter, 17 month old, um, we're, we're definitely uh, settling into Vermont. And we really are enjoying our experience uh, thus far. Uh, I'm, I'm excited. I'm pumped. I'm energetic, probably because I had more than two cups of coffee today. But uh, I'm also I feel like I'm honest, uh, maybe to a fault sometimes. Uh, caring and definitely focused. And I'm very happy to have been selected your superintendent. Great. So uh, a little bit about me. Who am I? Uh, so there's a picture of me a long time ago on the mountains in uh, Lake, near Lake Tahoe, uh, but I do like to get out on an, an adventure. I don't hold the first line against me. I did grow up in New Jersey, uh, the great state of New Jersey, and now I'm in the great and amazing state of Vermont. Uh, I do have um, two parents and one younger sister. I grew up in a house where I was uh, very overprotective of my sister. I will admit that. And she had the last laugh because she uh, ended up marrying my friend from college. So uh, she had the laugh last. And uh, they do have um, two beautiful uh, children who, uh, who are my nephew and niece. I uh, did attend several schools growing up. Uh, I uh, had a difficult time in middle school as a child because uh, I was uh, a little bit of a behavior problem. My behavior is much better now, so I just want to let the board know that. Um, and uh, th the next thing is I did go to uh, a an all-boys school, which uh, helped whip me into shape a little bit. Uh, I was, um, it, it was an all-boys school in Bergen Catholic, known as Bergen Catholic. Uh, if you can bring the, bring the next one down, Keith, thanks. Uh, and I, I was a track, I ran track, I was very fast. I played football on their nationally ranked football program and I got good grades. I uh, moved on from high school and I went to uh, University of Delaware and graduated there with a uh, bachelor's in uh, history, social studies education. And then I continued my education at Rutgers for my master's in history. Then I also went to University of Connecticut, a little background there. Uh, I did, um, 
uh, graduated from other uh, significant programs in the state of Connecticut uh, and some national programs. One was the Urban School Leaders Fellowship Program. I was part of the LEAD Co Connecticut Principal Cohort for Principal Leadership. I graduated from the Relay National Principals Academy. And I also had been to uh, China setting up Chinese exchange programs, uh, set up uh, eight Chinese exchange programs, totaling over 60 educators went back and forth to China. And uh, this is, of course, pre-COVID a long time ago. Uh, but we did, we were able to send over 150 students as well to China. Uh, and we did some educational uh, sharing and uh, some projects with our friends in China. My journey to the Washington Central School District uh, began when I was, it began in the Stanford Public Schools in Connecticut. I served as a high school social studies teacher for a number of years. I was also uh, worked as the program director for newcomer students. Uh, newcomers is uh, students who came from another country and uh, these children did not speak English and uh, folks uh, needed some help in how to determine English language instruction and placement into school systems to make sure the children had an access to the curriculum. I also uh, was a, an assistant principal at Schofield uh, Magnet Middle School in Stanford, and we were one of the, uh, we held, at the time, we were one of the more successful schools in the district, according to student achievement, and uh, for also doing some innovative things uh, with technology. All right, next slide. I was 12 years in Stanford. I also uh, went to, became a principal in Wyndham Middle School. Uh, this was uh, a school that had uh, significant challenges in, uh, in student achievement, uh, economic resources. Uh, we worked with the uh, commission, commissioner of education there. And we also had a special master appointed over our district. And we were uh, considered a, a time collaborative school because we extended the school day. And also we were a PBIS model school as well. All right, next slide. Uh, we did a lot of things in that school. It's about three years in Wyndham. Uh, I'm very proud of the work that we did there. Uh, we did, uh, we, you, you know, next slide, we'll uh, just go through that real quick. We did, uh, we turned our schools into small learning communities. We extended the school day. We improved student attendance, uh, teacher attendance. We got a perfect score in the PBIS set walkthrough. And uh, we had a 100% teacher retention rate uh, in year three, where we were uh, happy to uh, say that after going through all these changes, the teachers wanted to stay and uh, really try to build upon the success that we had done. Uh, here's some academic achievement. I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to data, full disclosure. I do like looking at the data. Uh, this uh, I thought was a major accomplishment. It still obviously had a lot more work to do, uh, a lot where to go, but the trend was moving up over the three years. Uh, we went from uh, not having a lot of resources and not lot having a lot of uh, uh, structures in place to changing our complete, complete structure and uh, basically providing an opportunity for uh, teachers and students and administrators across the district to really come together around student achievement. Next slide. I also spent six years, uh, the last six years as a principal in uh, American History High School as a, uh, in the Newark Public Schools. Uh, we were able to, during that time, we made a, the American History High School was a silver school in the, according to US News and World Report, which is considered one of the top uh, schools in the United States. Uh, we, I was very happy that we were able to keep the school open during a time where uh, there was uh, charter schools moving into the, into the district. Uh, and we had uh, really tried to make sure we kept the academic achievement of our students up. Uh, we had the highest growth in uh, the district for, par for the park, which is similar to the SBAC. Uh, there's some nuances and differences, but that was the test they used in New Jersey. Uh, in Torrington Middle School, my most recent uh, position, we uh, expanded the inclusion model for special education students. We reduced suspensions in school-based arrests and were able to prevent a state takeover uh, as uh, there was con some concern there. Next. Here are my core beliefs. I'm, I always look at these core beliefs and I always um, consider revising them and changing them and uh, adding to them. But right now, uh, you know, I believe that every student as, is at a turning point in his or her life when they're in our school. And it's really up to all of us to work together to make sure that each child's turn, uh, turning point 
in school is one that sets him on the path for college and career readiness. I believe it is the responsibility of the school to create conditions for each and every child to prepare to be prepared for future outside of high school. Uh, every child, every adult in the child's life can make a difference. I believe in empowering educators. Uh, this is, I believe in really working together with uh, adults who work with children, all the adults uh, that work with children to really make sure that they're involved and, uh, and their voices are heard and uh, they're, that they're, they're honored in the work that they do every, each and every day. And I believe that the teacher uh, outside, the teacher is the most important person in the life of a child when the child is in school. Uh, and uh, and I, I really truly believe that. I know parents are very important. We have your uh, children for two, we have your ch children for about a third of the day and you have them for two thirds of the day. Uh, however, when they're in school and in the building, the teacher I believe is the most important person. Uh, collaboration and cooperation is essential uh, to creating some coherence around how we do business. And I know that uh, our district is newly merged and there's uh, lots of, uh, I think there's a lot of work ahead in order to build that coherence around uh, making sure the right hand and the left hand know what, what we're doing as we're moving forward to improve our schools and school district. And I also believe that most people uh, enter the profession of education uh, because they like kids and that they hold themselves internally accountable to the work more than external accountability. I, I'm all about external. I'm all about uh, holding people accountable. However, I think more most people hold themselves accountable doing the work themselves. And I feel that uh, when we really want to make uh, changes and and uh, improve our schools, it's really about how do we connect the initiatives that we're doing to help people hold themselves internally accountable. Okay. What you can expect from me, all right? Highly visible. Um, listen before I act, open door policy, become a better superintendent each and every day, offer my support, communicate, and gather information first, align, Missions, goals, second, and then let's do it together. And uh, and just to uh, conclude, it is an honor to be your superintendent. Uh, I was uh, very humbled uh, to be selected in such an amazing school district. And uh, I uh, look forward to getting to learn our, about our district. I will be, uh, I do have a, a plan in place to really get to know the district and really uh, take pause and try to understand what people people's expectations are for the district so we can definitely pave a path forward for our district together. And uh, that is my uh, introduction, Scott. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brian. Now, um, I, I think it's, it's great to have some sense of, of you as a, as a person, as, as an executive, so that we can, um, you know, our, ourselves in our own working relationship, get as much done as we can for <laughs> the good of, of the students and um, all of the people who support us. Um, so anyway, thank you again. Now we get to go back to you for the business at hand. Great. Well, and I, I want to say that uh, I'm actually very impressed with myself that I, I, I didn't, I, we're not, I'm still not talking about the PowerPoint and talking on the PowerPoint because uh, I am a talker and I like to talk. So uh, I, I'm working on that as a, uh, as my, my own personal growth, but uh, I will let you know that uh, uh, I do appreciate uh, you, Scott, and uh, thanks for facilitating this. And I am ready to talk about my superintendent report, which is a, uh, I did issue a memo to the uh, Board of Education, and it was a few pages. And I'm not going to read directly from the report, but I do want to talk about the highlights of the report and where we're currently at. I uh, had a uh, spent a lot of time last week with the leadership team, who I believe has put our district in a situation where we are ahead of the curve with a lot of things. There's a, a lot of good work 
uh, that is happening in the month of June, uh, uh, in particular with the uh, plans of looking at reopening school. Uh, there is a lot of questions. I'm not going to, the ground seems to be constantly moving below, below our feet as the AOE, the Department of Health, and the CDC, and you, know, you, name, the, uh, you name the different governmental agencies, uh, continue to offer guidance and issue new guidance, I would say on a daily basis. And so, um, but uh, the, so the purpose really was to get the Board of Education and uh, uh, our community to start thinking about uh, school reopening. Uh, the number one thing we can do for our children right now, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and this was uh, mentioned to me and I have to agree with it, uh, is what kind of intervention, the, the biggest intervention for our children that we can do right now is reopening school and bringing them back into school. Of course, however, though, we need to make sure it's done safely. Uh, we need to make sure that children are safe, the adults who work with children are safe, uh, that the spread and the risk of spread of this horrible, horrible disease is minimized to a point where uh, it is safe to come to school. Uh, there are a lot of, there's a lot of work about this. So uh, the most recent guidance came from the Vermont Department of Health and Vermont Agency of Education in a document entitled uh, A Strong and Healthy Start, Safety and Health Guidance for Reopening Schools. Uh, I believe we did have, uh, there was a lot of meetings with superintendents, the commissioner, the Department of Health last week. I, I was involved in that meeting. Uh, and I do know that they answered many, many questions. It was a very helpful meeting. Uh, however, I do know that there are additional questions that will be that were asked. And I do understand, it is my understanding that there'll be additional guidance to happen sometime around mid-July. Uh, now, of course, there's guidance happening every day, but I believe that there'll be another major guidance document coming out in mid-July is what I was led to believe uh, at this time. So uh, the, some of the highlights is that the districts have been asked to consider opening uh, in three to focus, at, focus their planning efforts on three areas. Uh, number one, prepare for in-person classroom instruction so students may return to their classrooms. Number two, build capacity to carry on high quality remote learning where necessary. Uh, consider, uh, number three, consider developing plan and develop plans for a hybrid learning model where students have access to both in-person classroom instruction and high quality remote learning. Uh, that's kind of like some, I know well, Scott, one of your folks mentioned, uh, you know, a flipped classroom. You know, it's kind of, a, there's different variations of a flipped or a blended learning classroom uh, where you have, uh, it's like a hybrid between in-person and uh, staying at home and doing remote learning. Uh, I know that there are some families that have decided that they're not going to send their kids to school. I believe that one of the gentlemen in the audience had uh, mentioned that, and uh, you know, he's, he said he's not interested in, in uh, sending uh, in-person in schooling because of the, uh, and I understand that there will be some parents that are doing that. Uh, that's why we have to explore the remote learning possibility as well. So it's like we're trying to build our capacity to return to school in the fall remotely, uh, in person, and maybe a combination of the two. Uh, and so that's really uh, what the, that's what, and that's really what a lot of our conversations with the leadership team uh, last week was all about. And I have to say that they are um, much further along. Uh, there uh, have been five task forces uh, that were created in June. Um, and they've met several times in June. They're, they're asking questions. They're asking all the right questions. I have to tell you, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, the, I'm a person of the philosophy that it, you know, it's better to get a lot of people in the room to talk about something and make, make this, come up with ideas and then start asking when, how are we going to ma start making decisions. Uh, they have been doing great. There are five task forces here. Uh, I'll name them real briefly. The Logistics Task Force, uh, the Health and Facilities Task Force, the Policy, Finance, and Communication Task Force, the Social Emotional Learning Task Force, and the Curriculum Instruction and Assessment Task Force. And together, these uh, groups are really meeting uh, once to two times, two times a week, putting together minutes, asking questions, uh, asking challenging questions, things that you know folks may not may not have thought of before. Uh, and what's happening is we take these ideas, and I'm talking I'm talking about long lists of questions. Related to health, relate related to safety, related to buying items that we may not have thought of before, uh, and then uh, trying to find out the best answers. So we are a good steward 
of the of of the taxpayers' money because we don't want to spend money uh, at, on at, on every little thing when we don't need to. But we also want to make sure we're doing it in a way where it's gonna we're gonna get the biggest bang for a dollar and making sure that folks feel safe and are safe when they come back to school. Um, the um, Vermont Department of Health uh, did uh, uh, recommend a COVID-19 coordinator. The COVID-19 coordinator will be establishing, uh, reviewing and implementing health and safety protocols uh, to design to ensure all staff, students and families have a healthy and safe reopening of schools this fall. Uh, they have recommended that it's a nurse uh, a nurse, it could be a healthcare professional, but it's recommended that it's a, a nurse because the nurse, uh, a registered nurse, has that background and can dedicate their full time in service to looking at all these issues, especially as these task force come up with these laundry list of items, some which um, will, um, which are challenging, some of them are which are challenging because it does require medical background in a lot of these cases to think about these different uh, conversations. Um, and you really want to have someone who's on the, who's on who's who's coming to work every day focused on this piece, uh, just focusing on this all day long. I mean, I've been focusing on this all day. The last several days went before I got here on COVID nineteen and talking to folks about it. And it seems to be the only thing we do end up talking about. However, to have a medical uh, a medical person who is dedicated just to this piece um, is what the recommendation has come from the uh, Department of Health and the AOE. Uh, the ultimate thing, the Washington Central Unified Union Dis School District uh, communities, all, all five communities, uh, really should expect school to look and feel very different than when school uh, when we had then we when we had school in the pre-COVID-19. Uh, it's just uh, uh, some changes that when talking about these things, uh, facial coverings will be required for all staff and students and all others when school is in session. Uh, social distancing is to occur in every school when and if possible and where practical. Physical barriers uh, in identified work areas and reception areas need to be will need to be installed. Uh, no outside visitors and volunteers. This is going to be tough, especially I know for our, some of our parents of our, our our little ones at the elementary school in particular. Uh, full disclosure: I had a, a hard time saying goodbye to my daughter yesterday when I dropped her off at daycare. Uh, was, and of course, she just turned around and looked at me and went, bye. <laughs> so, so I was a little shocked to say, hey, uh, hey, Zadie, uh, you're going to miss daddy? And she just said, bye. So uh, good for her, I said. But uh, so, so uh, but it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough because it's, it's, a, it's a change. Uh, parent and caregiver visits will need to be minimized and uh, required only in the school office uh, when, when their parent, uh, parents do visit. And they'll have to be scheduled. Uh, field trips will only be approved if they can maintain health, all health guidance and the, the guidance from the Agency of Commerce and Community Development as it relates to public outdoor spaces and pools. Uh, schools will have to implement specific cleaning and disinfecting protocols each day. Uh, all students will be assigned seats in their classrooms and on the school bus. So there'll be assigned seating. Uh, and, and that's a, a very important part of the reopening. And uh, most students, if not all students, should be expected to receive and eat meals in their classroom. Uh, uh, that, and that's really just some of the changes that are, are coming out uh, that looks like this is, uh, this is what school is going to look like if and when we reopen. Uh, there's a lot more to do. Um, I'm gonna promise to update the board as more information comes available. Um, there may be some opportunities that we'll have to purchase items throughout the summer. And I wanted to let the board know uh, that you know, cleaning supplies, online learning platforms, uh, plexiglass barriers, other types of uh, equipment that are deemed uh, necessary, safe, and uh, for healthy in school, for healthy and effective school operations. Um, so uh, there may be some items we have to bring up to bid. Uh, again, this is where we're currently at. The floor is constantly moving below my feet, and but uh, this. You know, it, it is uh, the up, upcoming year does present some uh, historic difficulties to schooling, but I know that by working together, we'll be able to uh, uh, make sure that we do have a real uh, safe and effective opening, reopening of school when that time does come. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, board members, do you have questions for Brian regarding this report or any of the, um, the highlights that he's just mentioned?
Marilyn. Thank you, Brian. Um, I don't have a question, but Rick, I don't know if you're still on the phone, um, but I did want to speak to the coordinator part as an as a nurse and why I do hear you <clears throat> and completely understand your perspective of, of why I, I wish that we could use what the AOE and um, and what the the Board of Health in Vermont gives us as guidelines, but really to have someone be able to be available in the district in real time and respond immediately to our district's specific questions or concerns when it comes up would be important. And I'll just give you an example, Rick. Um, prior to when this started, but we were all still in school, I asked, <clears throat> do the nurses have PPE, which is personal protective gear, which now everyone knows what that means, but back then no one did. Um, where are the meds for the kids that are coming into the nurse's office? Because if you have a child come into the nurse's office that's symptomatic and they're spreading that virus, now all your children's meds that need their insulin, their inhalers, all of that's contaminated. So these were the initial conversations and it was, it wasn't, it hadn't been a thought. Uh, of course it is now and it's a different, it's different and everyone's more aware, but to be able to have that medical coordinator, I think would be the, in the best interest of the district. Could you maybe get creative of, of that and not necessarily have to create another position perhaps, but that's from a healthcare professional's perspective, why I feel like it would be important to support that for the amount of time that we have to deal with COVID in the next one to two years. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, board members, uh, other, other questions or um, clarifications? Flora. I have, thank you, Brian, and welcome. I have a quick question. I, in one of the last uh, memos that talks about central office, I guess in general, as we're looking at doing uh, any construction work or any COVID barriers, that to make sure that we take into consideration the long-term effect of that and the design process on that, and just because, so that we don't end up doing uh, things just uh, temporarily by uh, custodians right now, which have the best intentions, but that we put a little thought into it at the long term, because there's ways to do it that would be more meaningful for, for kids, especially considering one of the recommendations on enclosing the entry area, which just because I'm familiar with that project and I worked on that uh, last year, just looking at it with more detail, uh, with design in mind, that's just my two my two cents. And then as far as the, uh, what Mary Lynn was just talking about, I, I agree I agree with her. And when we had our, uh, I, I understand where uh, Rick is coming from too, but I also, when we were looking at the efficiency report, that was one of the things that we had in that efficiency report. It was making one of the nurses at our schools, the leading nurse for our district. That's something that we've been wanting to do for a while and efficiency that we haven't achieved. So maybe depending on the population of our schools, we can increase somebody to, to that position instead of hiring new. There can be, depending on the numbers, we can have a school nurse that is a leader within that and achieve that efficiency too. Thank you, Flora. Um, Stephen. I have thoughts on all these things as well, but I'd prefer to hold them until we get to the discussion action portion of the meeting to go over it. Very good. No, no questions in the meantime? Stephen? No? Okay. Um, other questions or... Um, Jaya? Yes? Um, the reason I keep turning my video off is because I have really bad internet and I'm trying to increase my broadband and um, it was a struggle for my kids to do remote learning, but I'm just wondering what the plan is to help kids who have bad internet if there is some portion of the school week or um, 
part of the year or something that is remote learning. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's so, a, that, oh, sorry. No, yeah, that, finish. That's, Go a, ahead, that's a great question. Uh, but, uh, and uh, I would have to say that uh, the, uh, you know, just to, uh, just to reiterate the, uh, you know, long-term effect, you know, going back to just going down in order here, uh, you know, I know Flora talked about long-term planning. I think that's uh, definitely something we have to think about when anytime you spend any money, what is the long-term effects on any of these projects? Uh, and, uh, and I, and I have to say with, uh, you know, what is the plans for kids that have a bad internet? Uh, I know that's something that we're, we're, we're definitely been looking into. I have, I'm still getting through my 825 emails. Uh, so uh, there may be something more in there uh, about uh, uh, internet broadband, but I do know that, uh, that that has been a conversation across the state, and uh, I can definitely look look into more information and get back to you on that. Thanks, Brian, and thank you, Jaya. I had one uh, more question. Sorry, Scott. Please, um, go I'm a little concerned about children who may be hard of hearing with the masks. I know that some people have a hard time um, hearing because of them. And I don't know if there's any thought about that or discussion around um, how to deal with that, how to address that. I, I see Lindy um, has her hand up. <laughs> Couldn't find my mouse to unmute. Um, I actually contacted the AOE about that and suggested the Clear Mask. It's a company that makes a, what's called Clear Mask, and they're sold only in bulk because it's not just for the hard of hearing, but for elementary. If you're doing a read aloud and you can't see any of the expression, you can't comprehend. And the whole idea of teaching reading comprehension is reading body language as well. And students who are on the spectrum, body language is so important. So I sent it off just kind of on a whim. And the friend that I sent it to, it's been going up the chain of command. And what I have gotten in response is also because of hearing impaired, you can only buy them in groups of 10,000. So I suggested the AOE buy them for every educator in the state and use their COVID money that way to distribute. I have no idea if it will keep going up, but as somebody who teaches early childhood and reading, you have to be able to see my mouth, the lips, all of that moving. And so there has to be a way, and these clear masks look very comfortable and they work, they're approved and everything. So um, I just thought I'd let you know. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you, Lindy, for uh, sharing that. I also uh, know that, and I, I correct, if I may be wrong on the actual name of the department, I'm learning about all the, a lot, lots of different departments in our, at the, uh, in uh, Montpelier, but the, uh, one of the uh, departments is uh, looking into emergency preparedness, looking at, uh, ordering items in bulk. So uh, that might be something that they're going to be looking into. I'm hoping that the guidance from uh, the middle of July will give us more of an information about that. Uh, I also know that some folks are using face shields. I see someone just uh, pop that up. I, I, we, uh, I have seen some of the principals wear the face shield. I like it because I get to know automatically what people are thinking. Are they smirking? Are they smiling? Are they going, you know, so I, I, I definitely like, like the idea. Uh, and of course, this is something that, uh, you know, again, not being the medical professional, but finding out from medical professionals what can work and what, what won't work in uh, schools for, for children. Marilyn? Um, just a, a quick thought that I'm sure you guys are thinking of. Um, yes, the face shields are great. It's hot that they're hot, um, but better, you know, better than nothing. I'm just wondering about as you can, think about allocating spots um, and transitioning some of our areas, common areas that kids cannot be using, where or if the task force are talking about having rooms that the kids can take a, a bit of a break and a breather from the masks, because that will be important. So just, I'm sure it's out there, but wanted to. Thanks, Marlon. Gillian? Uh, just to, to dovetail on what Brian said, we are looking into the face shields because Lindy's right in terms of the early literacy, that's a huge concern. Um, and we've been um, <laughs> piloting different versions and assessing them for comfort and, and heat. The other thing is that we're also 
really in terms of planning and how we're looking at really just recognizing kids are going to need breaks, not just from the masks, but also just from the kind of the weird way that, that school is going to be happening. It's going to be really different. So a lot of the emphasis of the first several weeks of school is going to be figuring out how to do this new version of school. But we're also all, and I'm on the facility side, but we're also looking at how can we have sort of movement break spaces? How can we have sort of decompression break spaces, all those kinds of things. So using our unused spaces creatively. But keep those, I mean, keep those questions coming because and if, there's a lot to think about and I'm sure we're missing stuff. Thank you, Gillian. Yeah, uh, Janice. Um, obviously this would be a very part-time solution, but are we thinking about outdoor classrooms in any way? Okay. <laughs> That was a thumbs up from Gillian for whoever was unable to see it. Um, so, uh, board members, anything more? Uh, any further questions on the superintendent report? If not, we can move on to a kind of interlude, but related on the uh, board retreat, which at the moment, I think we, uh, at our last meeting, we, we sort of set for August 8th. But Floor, um, do you wanna take the lead on this? Sure, I, I just wanted to, since we had the opportunity to be together and this was the first time we were with Brian, just go back to what I had shared with you from, from Brian and just make sure there was some question about doing it on, on person or, or via Zoom. So I thought we, we could talk about that too but mainly the, the retreat, make sure that everybody was on the same page that August 8th was the, was the retreat uh, for half a day, breakfast and lunch. It, it's an all day thing, right, Brian? And that uh, we would um, give an option for not being in person, but because it's not a board meeting, I know that that question was raised in an email and I didn't wanna to reply to everybody that is more of a retreat, uh, just get a sense how people in their order for planning, how people felt about doing it in person, which for a retreat, I think is important, but that's just my personal opinion. Yeah, um, I, I think what we may have to do is actually address some of the same issues that we're addressing for the reopening of school, since um, I, I understand that some board members may actually be um, trying to also to protect older relatives with whom they're, you know, they're sort of in the same pod. And um, we need to be uh, aware and um, uh, accommodating of that. Uh, and there may be other reasons as well. Um, so whatever we do, I, I agree. I think in-person is always preferable to, you know, even to this. But um, I think we have to have, we have to be able to do it all, um, have it arranged in that, in that way. Um, so uh, what about the dates? Um, Brian, you were not able to be, well, you were just, you were not even here um, on the job when we had our last meeting. Is August 8th a possibility for you? Uh, it's definitely a possibility for me. I'm, uh, I'm, not, I'm here for the board. Uh, if that works for the board, it's gonna work for me. I'll, if I have something, and if that date doesn't work for, for some people on the board, Let's find a different day because I, I really think it's uh, really important that everyone participates. Uh, every single board member. Uh, I, I also prefer to have it in person. However, I, I'm not going to uh, risk uh, anyone's you know health or anything else. Or if obviously we're going to find f follow all the guidance and guidelines. If we have to sit there uh, and be socially distant with masks on, or if we have to, some folks can't do it because they are caring for loved ones at home and they they just don't want to. Uh, do that. I don't blame them, but the big thing is making sure that I think all the board members uh, can make it. I, I think that's a really big thing. Uh, yeah. yeah. And so that, that was really a big thing. And, uh, and again, meeting in person is preferable, but obviously uh, it's, you know, we live in interesting times. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Yes. Um, my recollection is that Kari August 8th was a problem. Yeah. So we maybe um, rather than rather than try to work out calendar stuff um, during the meeting, 
Um, maybe we can open it up again and just see, just find out. Do a, um, what do they call those polls that they do? A doodle poll. Doodle, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Showing my age. Um, so, and, and figure out a, a possible alternative. Um, does that sound good, everybody? Okay. Uh, who will who will send out that doodle poll? Is it will I be or... <laughs> responsible? You're responsible for everything. Yes, there we go. Scott. Okay. <laughs> no, um, but right, I, I think can do it. Michelle, Michelle would Michelle do it. Michelle will do yeah. it. Yeah. All right, yeah. Michelle will do it, Brian. No worries. <laughs> Thanks, Lori. <laughs> Thank you very much. Lori to the rescue. <laughs> should I should I be picking when we ask Michelle, when I ask Michelle to put this together, uh what I would prefer to do it on a Saturday or a Sunday. Uh I, but I don't want to presume, you know, but I definitely think it has to be a full day. And I, I prefer a weekend date just because I think it just sends a good message that we're really, you know, this, this is not just a, a, another board meeting. This is a, a, a retreat. We're really going to sit down and talk and uh, try to come up with uh, and work together, come up with a, a plan to work together. Okay, hey, sir. So we had talked that it was important that it happened in August and we had put two dates out, the 8th and the 15th and the 15th, more people had conflict. So maybe extend it. We don't want to get it too close to when you guys are super getting ready to be in school too. So I think we would have to adapt to the leadership team and, and, and you, there's not that many yeah. <laughs> Saturdays, but. Yeah. It, well, well, I would say, I, I would say just so, uh, Flora, so thank you for bringing that up. So I would say if we have to push it into September or even October, just to pick a, a weekend day, uh, I would also uh, say that this retreat really should be for the superintendent only and the board of education members. Uh, my leadership team, I'll be working with closely, uh, but I think that the, uh, the retreat really should be between me and the board. Oh, totally, totally. Just uh, that you were not busy with them getting into school. That was what I. Oh meant. no! Oh, oh, I'm yeah, sorry. With okay. Your okay. With your calendars and stuff, and just right before you guys are in the thick of it, we interrupting your work. That's yeah. that's all. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that, and trust me, Flor, we're in the thick of it right now. <laughs> so I know it's day one, but uh, it's uh, we're we're all re very busy. I know that. Um, and then the other thing was uh. Have we talked at the floor? Did you mention anything about a facilitator with everyone? I know we, okay. So I don't know what what was mentioned or not. Uh, you know, I, I, I have a facilitator in mind that, that could be very helpful. Uh, you know, full disclosure to the, all the rest of the board. It is someone who uh, I have worked with and uh, worked with, and he is ser currently serving as a, a mentor to me. Uh, so it could be helpful to have that person. Uh, what I've learned about a lot of folks in Vermont is that uh, folks, the Vermonters do not hold any punches. They speak, they speak, speak their mind and say, say what's on their mind. Uh, and I think that uh, the person I was thinking of is gonna be pretty, very honest with it. He's not gonna hold back. He'll be very honest with, with me, with board of education members. And really, I think to have a facilitator like that, who is going to be, uh, you know, just really talk, uh, talk and walk, and who has walked the walk uh, before. Uh, it's, a, it's a former superintendent. He's nationally known. He's been involved in lots of uh, different uh, types of uh, uh, states, worked, worked in different states as a superintendent, has uh, lots of different success. And I think it could be someone who um, would work well uh, with us. What's, what's the, who is it? Uh, his name is Nick Fisher. Thank you. Oh, so it, we talked about to not take a lot of time because I know we schedule a short meeting today with a lot of packed action. So Scott asked at the last meeting, just refreshing our memory, if there were volunteers to help with the retreat and Scott and myself volunteer. So we would bring a proposal to wherever that date is. It uh, would accommodate, you know, what your wishes are to for, for that for that retreat. So we could have a small working group and then share with the board the, the options. But I think we all felt that it was it was okay to have facilitators. So we could have a show of hands for that and then go from there. Yeah. Sounds good, Flo. 
So you're, you're thinking a show of hands right now. Show of hands for um, those in favor of a facilitator. Okay, I'm seeing mostly hands. Um, so uh, anybody downright object among the board members? What's the cost? <laughs> Good question. We can find that out and then and then um, make the decision at that point. Have the decision hinge on that being a factor in considering. But we can go forward at least with uh, uh, the possibility. Would that be okay with you, Stephen? Great. Okay. Terrific. So um, if we may move on then to uh, finance, the um, what I might do just so as to have it flow more logically is um, if there's no objection among board members uh, to kind of interlace 4.0 and 5.0 and actually start off with <clears throat> um, a motion for the action. Uh, in other words, a motion for 5.1 and then the discussion would be the discussion that's labeled 4.1 would take place as a discussion of the motion. Um, is there any objection among board members to doing it that way? Okay, very good. Um, in that case, uh, I would entertain a motion. I move that we authorize the hiring of a COVID-19 coordinator um, who would be a nurse to serve for the next school year. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. Um, second? I'll second. Marilyn seconds. Thank you very much. Okay, now um, discussion of that motion. Um, and 4.1 also has additional school nurse. We'll do that under 5.2. Um, so uh, we're talking about the COVID-19 coordinator now. We've heard from members of the public. Um, uh, we've heard from members of the board uh, regarding the, um, the necessity and the desirability of this position. Um, care to expand, develop it, Lindy? Um, I had concerns about the cost as well. And when we're also increasing Callis and Doty to full-time, which I think is a complete necessity that they need a full-time nurse on site in a school with what's going on. But I like the idea of a leader within the district being somehow those, um, the time of that job being reallocated in a way that they are attending to this task force or whatever is necessary for this. But I think we could do it, and I'm not saying without increasing Callis and Doty, but as is without hiring a new coordinator. So if I understand correctly, um, increase Callis and Doty, and then out of that additional capacity, ha designate someone we already have or will already have on staff as COVID coordinator. Um, did, I, did I understand that correctly? Yes. Okay, That's thank you. And Maria. Hi there. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Maria Malegos. I'm actually the school nurse for both Callis and Dodie. Um, and I am super excited to see that um, this motion is being brought forth to expand those positions. I've been very concerned about those schools having part-time nurses for next year. So thank you. Um, I would like to speak a little bit to the notion of um, putting um, one of our nurses into this COVID coordinator position um, as somebody uh, sort of on, on the ground, if I may. Um, the reality of the situation is I have worked for the district for two years now on a part-time basis. Um, the Romney nurse is new this year. The uh, middle school nurse at U32 has been there for two years and she is training a new high school nurse this year. Um, the nurse for 
East Montpelier has gone to halftime and is training a new halftime nurse as well at East Montpelier. Um, the nurse at Berlin um, has three children under the age of five and if school closes, um, will not be able to continue to work, will need to be at home with her children. So while realistically, I see the need to try to um, curb the financial insanity that seems to be occurring this year, um, but realistically, I don't think this is a year to pull punches on what we need. Uh, and I <clears throat> really would encourage you to have somebody to take this on full time. The nurses basically are reinventing the wheel of our jobs um, all summer long, right? Um, before school starts, it's gonna look nothing like we've done. Our responsibilities are, in, are going to include what has been a full-time job in the past and all the way up to here, right? They're asking us to track attendance, track illnesses, um, work with um, vaccinations with parents who haven't wanted to take their kids to the doctor this year. Um, really reassuring the entire world that we're keeping everybody safe and expecting us to be able to add responsibilities to that, I feel is unrealistic given what our staffing looks like at the moment. Um, so my encouragement is that while I recognize that it might be difficult financially um, in such an unprecedented time, I would really encourage you to take a much bigger picture look at what that person could do for us in the district. Thank you, Maria, very, very useful. Um, uh, Lori and then Dorothy. I just want oh. to clarify how the $90,000 was identified. It is a, a nurse, it falls on our teacher salary scale. So it's someone in the middle of that grid. Um, but I've anticipated that there could be a person that takes the family plan health insurance. So the 90,000 may be a high um, estimate. Um, I also wanted to let you know that the nurses have sent a letter to our office identifying that they're really concerned about substitutes this coming year and the need to possibly have a float, I guess is the best way to describe it. In lieu of a sub, it may be this nurse could serve as a float to help out in time of need at particular locations. So we are looking at hiring nursing subs and trying to fill our uh, human resource pool so that we're ready for this. Um, there is a nursing shortage, and I just wanted to put that play out there on behalf of the district. Thank Thanks, you. Lori. Um, Dorothy. Um, well, I was glad to hear Maria's uh, countdown of how, how every school is served by nurses. Um, it interested me that the East Mount Pillar nurse is only half time. So um, at least that's what Maria said. Sorry, she has another halftime nurse. There's going to be a full-time coverage at East Montpelier, but she's training basically her replacement. I don't mean to speak for Elizabeth. She's also in this meeting. So if she wishes to speak, um, I would encourage that. But she's going to be working halftime and there is another nurse working halftime. Um, I don't know how appropriate it would be to ask a new nurse to take on the COVID coordinator position as well. Um, it strikes me as being um, unrealistic. I will say very prematurely that I have spoken to a friend of mine who is a district parent who has school nursing experience, who has her doctorate as a nurse practitioner, who would be very keen to walk out of CDMC and take a COVID coordinator position within the district. Um, so that there are there are interested parties for this type of position. Okay, what I, I misunderstood when you said, when you were talking about the East Montpelier position, I understood her to be working half time and at the same time training another nurse. Now it seems to me what you really what really happening is she'll be working half time and training another nurse who will be working the other half of the time. That's so correct. That is different than than what I anticipated. Um, possibly, if we need a floater, which I think is a, a really really good idea that whoever we get, if we finally decide to do this, that would be part of their um, duties would be a floater. Because I, I honestly don't see how th this, this is gonna be a very busy position and very responsible position 
but I'm not entirely sure it would be a full time position. Um, um, I think that's an excellent we have point. To, I'm talking. We have to allow for that, um, but uh, it's something to consider. Thank you. Maria. Um, I apologize. I did not mean to interrupt. I just wanted to say, I think that's an excellent point. I know that other nurse leader positions do have about 75% administrative work and 25% direct patient care. Um, if there are nurses that are not at work, then they can step in and do the job at those schools. That's all I wanted to say. I do apologize for interrupting. Thank you. Um, Stephen, Luke. Um, so I'll bring up, I guess not unusual for me, perhaps a different spin on this. Um, I serve on the Norwich Reopening um, Task Force. Um, and when we approached this um, concern, it's not identical for colleges as it is for public schools. Um, we felt like um, the nurses we had available um, had enough expertise to understand the legislation and the learning. And what we, what we didn't need was another nurse. What we needed was someone that was familiar with VOSHA and OSHA and facilities who could take the medical recommendations and, and with an knowledge and understanding of facilities put those recommendations into practice. Um, we also elected not to go with a full-time position. We hired a consultant for the first three or four months. Um, so just as uh, not to say that uh, a, a COVID coordinator isn't valuable, it might not have to be a full year, one-time FTE. Um, and, um, does it necessarily have to be a nurse? Um, and and I, I'm opening the discussion that perhaps um, we have plenty of nurses uh, working in our schools that can interpret and provide recommendations and then someone with knowledge of how to impl implement those recommendations um, with a facilities background is also a valuable consideration. Interesting. Um, Marilyn. I know that in the budget we had um, approved a facilities manager position, did we? Yeah, we and have. Have we hired into that? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I feel like you on top of that would need a, a medical professional um, from what I just heard from Maria, and Maria, correct me if I heard you wrong, is that a lot of the staff are fairly new to the district um, and thinking about not only the, the need for someone in facilities, but need for um, an understanding of quality and infection control and for, um, infection preventative measures. I think having a, an expert in the healthcare field coming in from a facility and maybe thinking outside of the scope of nursing, because I think you're right, we have school nurses that can do the school nursing part. We need someone that is a little bit more trained in infection control. Um, and that may be the part that the expertise would be coming into play. I would see that going hand in hand with our uh, facilities manager and working together collaboratively to to head up a task force. I think with the staffing again, while I would um, consider what Floor had mentioned earlier of of using our staff. Now that I'm here, Maria, I, I just I'm not sure that we have someone that would be qualified to do that. It is, and I, I hear you what you're saying about full time. Um, and certainly, I'm in a hospital. I'm I'm not in a school. But if we get a surge. It's full time plus full time. I mean, I I, I worked like I, I wasn't home, so this, there will certainly be, and unfortunately, I think enough for a, another nurse to do for at least the next year. Thanks, Marilyn. Um, Brian. Yes, and uh, I uh, I understand the uh, the desire to and, and be very 
being a good, uh, careful steward of our taxpayers' money. And I do understand that. I also, uh, you know, you're always balancing, you know, is the balancing taxpayers' money with, um, with the, uh, you know, safety of our children. And, and, I, and I think uh, that the, lead, talking with, my, with the leadership team uh, last week, uh, there was concern that they might even need more nurses than what we, even if we had this right now, because that is, there is a lot of fear about, uh, we want to make sure schools have uh, the appropriate medical staff to come to, uh, to come to, to come to, when we send our children to, to the school. So I, so I think it's a, I know it's a critical point and I, and I, I can hear, I, I hear different folks saying different things about, you know, we have to be careful with the money. I completely understand that. Uh, but I also know that uh, with the safety of the children and the safety of the adults, and, and in particular as well, uh, you know, I, I would I strongly recommend that we do uh, think about the COVID-19 coordinator being a full-time position. Uh, the other reason is, if you're trying to find someone in the medical field, uh, it's very sometimes it's very difficult to find someone on a part-time basis when there there is such a severe shortage uh, in the uh, industry right now. Uh, and I, I, there's like you can look at any most of the hospitals in Vermont. They have 80 to 100 openings. I mean, there's there's a lot of openings in these places. So even if we post it, well, you know, we still have to find the right person for this job, even if it's posted. So uh, it's not just we're, we're not just going to fill it if if just because it's approved. We're going to make sure we find the right person. Thanks, Brian. Chris. Um, Brian, what was the discussion about? Um, needing more nursing care because I'm thinking if that's a real consideration and concern, we should be talking about it now rather than later after the schools have started. Yeah, hi, Chris. Uh, so uh, basically, I think the uh, talking to the leadership team last week, uh, there was concern that there were some schools that did not have uh, school some school nurses. Uh, uh, part time, and while others had full time, uh, there was uh, a conversation about some of the full time ones are newer to working in schools, and so the idea was having a full time COVID coordinator who could kind of be like the utility person on a, you know, I think about the utility person on a baseball team, right, where they they have a certain role and that's that's what they do. But it, when school reopens and there's you know someone who's sick and you, you try to get nurse subs, but we can't find any nurse subs or we have uh, you know, an intercrisis. crisis. Uh, we, we have someone. We have a go-to person. And that was the idea about having the full-time COVID-19 coordinator be a nurse. So that was the other piece. Was uh, if if the COVID-19 person is a nurse, we can actually deploy them to the schools if and when necessary. I mean, God forbid there's an outbreak at one of the schools, and there and you know they have to do contact tracing, and uh, we have to start looking at the protocols and re-looking, re-examining the protocols. Well. I know uh, Marilyn just talked about it, saying, you know, it's what if and when that does happen, uh, there you're not you're never going to have enough nurses to begin with. But having that extra person uh, who is the coordinator uh, who has been just focusing on that and that only will be, I think, a major support to our principals and to our uh, nurses that are already out there in the field. Thanks, Brian. Let me just sorry, Chris. Um, one moment. Um, if I might, if I might just pause for just a second, um, just so that I don't lose the thread, um, just incorporating what Stephen and uh, Marilyn have talked about, um, and this COVID nineteen coordinator, although um, although a nurse, would part of the uh, what we're looking for would be someone preferably with OSHA um, experience or knowledge and um, infection control background. Um, so it would, it, it would not just be another uh, generic school nurse type. Uh, part of the job description would be tailored for these particular needs. Um, is, that, uh, is that how I understand the way that it's shaping up? That was certainly this, the discussion, but if we if we want that to happen, we should reformulate the motion so that it addresses that specifically. Um, but we also may be limited in terms of what's out there. And so in terms of who's available, even applying for the job. Um, so yeah, you're right, that's the goal, having someone who's uh, 
um, schooled in, in uh, VOSHA, OSHA, and also infectious disease, but that might be a, who knows if someone like that would apply. Yeah, I think the motion is probably okay as it is. And, and just, you know, the advice of the, of the board in this regard would, would be sufficient. But I'm, I'm curious to hear from board members who haven't yet had a chance to speak, uh, who might wish to speak. Um, Kari, for example. Um, um, I'll just I, I just repeat my comment that I just put in the chat that I'm persuaded. I think I think um, the staff has thought this through, and um, having a full time nurse for one year, given these circumstances, is um, we'll be sorry if we didn't, and and we look back and thought we should have. Thank you, um, Jonas. I thought I'd made a comment, but I mean I, I think this is absolutely essential. Um, the if, if society at large is going to get back to anything resembling normal, it really does have to start with opening schools um, so that a huge you know, portion of uh, the workforce can go back to work. Um, um, this sounds like an appropriate position. Um, and let's not forget the most, you know, the most optimistic estimates for a vaccine are early in 2021. Um, and there's going to have to be some significant messaging um, around that. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's keep in mind that we want that person to be able to, you know, conduct some public health messaging. Thank you. Thanks, Jonas. Diane. Um, I mean, I, I would agree with what everyone's saying that it certainly it it connects all. Um, the staffing isn't really where my wonders are and my worries are about expenditures. And so, um, because we know this one's temporary and addressing the immediate need of um, remote in terms of um, knowledge base and experience and ability to direct and guide what needs to happen for our kids. Thank you. George? I agree. Um, I also think um, that this position could move forward uh, education um, of families um, as well as students um, as we start the uh the school year um i think that's one of my big points is how are we going to educate families um and encourage them um to report um potential exposure and to avoid um potential exposure Sure. Wow. Um, thank um, you. Uh, education, obviously, is what's going to keep it out of our community. Yes. Yes. Thank you, George. I think you're also demonstrating Jayo's point about um, broadband and um, and the difficulty of, of trying to uh, work with without a good broadband system. Um, Jaya? Whatever George said, I agree with. <laughs> um, it was very intelligent. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm. I'm fine. I think. Um, I think it will help give some parents um, some ease of mind, and so it's probably a good thing to have in place. Um, great. Thank you very much. And uh, Lindy asked in the chat box if the salary was directly on the teacher contract grid. Um, Lori, is that something? That is the calculation that I used um, because the basic responsibilities of this position are similar to our nurses who are part of the teachers union. Very good. Okay. Um, so has, have all the board members had a chance to weigh in on this floor? Have you? 
I, I did at the beginning, and I just okay. added something on the chat just as a brainstorm after listening to Stephen and, and everybody. It, it strikes me that we could, you know, we don't need to wordsmith what goes out to find this COVID-19, but uh, a community health coordinator might be what we need because they, most of the time, they have been nurses before or interested, and they're more community-based, so they would be able to have a better understanding of how to communicate with communities, communicate with, so create more of a wellness plan for all of our communities. So we will be more of that lab of communities that we've been wanting to, to create. So uh, that is their experiences in healthcare coordination. And, you know, I'm not an expert on it, but it, they do help uh, in the nonprofit and in, in other countries, they, they do help and here they are important too. Thanks, Fly. Um, and Chris, last words before we go to, a, oh, and Marilyn, Chris and Marilyn, and then. Marilyn had her hand up first. Ah, very chivalrous of you. Marilyn. Uh, the, the one thing I've brought up a, a couple times in our policy committee, so, um, and this would be perfect, is I'm really concerned about the, the state truancy model um, and as it requires students to be excused from a pediatrician to have an excused absence, but I can't imagine the pediatricians are going to be seeing every child. It's going to be difficult. So I just want to mention that Brian and staff that are here right now, that that um, is, is really important. I feel like that this role takes on how to help families overcome that truancy issue. I've I'm glad that I've had the four. I brought up in policy, but just want to make sure I bring it back here. Interesting. Thanks. And Chris, your patience is rewarded. So if, if, this, if the goal is to have this person be a floater as well, I think they would need to be a licensed nurse with a current license. Just to have that understood. Point. Right. Okay. Hey, um, so, uh, Stephen Luke. Sorry. So thank you. I, I'll hold my comments on everything except one point. Is this a teacher position or a staff position? Um, go ahead, Lori. Um, our teachers agreement covers the nurses, so they follow all of the teaching um, positions that they have to get licensure through the agency of ed as well. Okay, but I'm asking specifically, is this contract an administrator contract or a teacher contract? A teacher contract. That's what we've been calculating it as. Is, is oh, and, and we know a reason we for being a teacher? Sorry, um, Stephen and then Chris. Um, I, I mean, I, I favor this concept in a COVID coordinator um, and I wanna be timely with it, um, but I, I want the person where we hire to be able to to do the work that needs to be done. Um, and, and the position to me sounds, it's to establish, review, and implement health and safety protocols, which doesn't sound like a teacher position. It sounds like an administrator position. Um, so, it was my anticipation that it was going to be administrative position. I can understand we might uh, um, establish the salary and benefits to mirror what a school nurse would get, but to to me, it's an administrative position. Brian, yes, uh, and it's it's. I wouldn't say it's an administrator position, basically because. Uh, if you hire a school nurse who's going to work with public health department and and you know, obviously we're going to definitely look at you know if someone has OSHA and you know we, I, I wouldn't put that in the posting because I, I wouldn't want to scare anyone away but that, you know we could definitely consider that if there that person does exist uh, but but the uh, the big thing is uh, school nurse if they school nurse really isn't an administrator if they don't have uh, an administrator license 
So, uh, so I would, I think, because uh, you can't evaluate staff and do other things like that. So, I mean, this person would just be coordinating, uh, like almost kind of like a teacher on assignment in a central office in, in some ways, where they're working uh, you know, on, a, on a specialized project, which would be the coordination of the COVID-19 uh, mm -hmm. and whatever that, it's going to help us understand as the ground moves below us, they're going to help us make sense of that more uh, than uh, an administrator who doesn't have a medical background. Thank you, Brian. Um, Chris, you're still, you're still. So from a contractual standpoint, can this person be both an administrator and perform nursing services? Because if one of the, if one of the goals is to have this person as essentially a backup nurse, um, I think we have to be aware of that and they should be informed of that. But are we, can that person straddle being an administrator and then also, if needed, do nursing work in the schools? Well, uh, Chris, I think it's going to be very difficult to find someone who has both credentials as an RN and uh, and a uh, administrator in a school in a school district. Uh, and it, my, my recommendation would be to go with a uh, uh, someone who uh, is uh, able to work as a nurse and has certain backgrounds. Maybe they worked in leadership positions in in me in the medical profession, but it may be uh, difficult to find someone who has an administrative background for education. Which usually requires a, uh, a specialized degree. And okay. um, I'm, not, I'm not requiring. That be, um, Sorry, Chris. Uh, um, Diane had her hand up. Okay. To me, um, what's we're not asking this person to have the autonomy and the authority to make these decisions. What we're asking this person is to be the expert in this field and to be advising that we do have the autonomy and the authority. Um, and so I don't, I don't think we need to worry about whether or not that credential is there for an administrator. We just need to know that they have the direct line of communication and ability and we have to trust that those who are the administrators are going to act on that expertise and authority. That's what the position strikes me as. Thanks, Diane. Um, are we ready to move to a vote on this? Have we, uh, I'm, I'm seeing some nodding heads. Um, all right, so the motion, so, oh, Chris. That, that one more, I just, for clarity's sake, we're hiring um, someone who would be under a teacher's contract as opposed to an administrator. Is that right? Is that what we're proceeding? I mean, I'm fine with that. I just, for clarity, that's what we're going to do. That's what the motion is. Yes, and that's what all okay. the heads are nodding for. Yes. Scott, so I just I have one clarifying question. This is just yeah. for a year, so we would reevaluate the situation and rehire accordingly? Correct. The motion is for a year. As, uh, as made by Chris and seconded by Marilyn. Um, actually, Lisa, uh, may I impose on you please to read the, um, the motion again, just so that it's fresh in everybody's minds? Sure, it just says, Chris moved to authorize the hiring of a COVID-19 coordinator who would be a nurse to serve for the next school year. Great, and Marilyn seconded that motion. So, okay, <clears throat> we've, we've heard a lot of um, questions and comments and, uh, and some opposition also from the public. So at this point, all in favor of the motion, please click your yes button or your thumbs up button. Um, opposed, click no or thumbs down. And I see one no vote. Um, and all the rest, yeses. Okay, very good. Um, thank you, everyone. Now, so the motion carries, in other words. So um, if we go to 5.2 uh, and then uh, entertain a motion of 5.2, approve additional school nurse, anyone care to take that one on? I'll so moved. Uh, Jada, was that you? 
No, Mary Lynn. Mary Lynn, oh, okay. Thank you, Mary Lynn. Um, second? I'll second. Dorothy seconds. Okay, very good. Um, how about discussion of this one? Are there any questions or have they been elucidated during the course of previous talk? Chris? So are these um, one year hires or are these permanent hires? Meaning, are these expected to now be full time nurses at uh, Doty and Cows? Is that what we're voting on? Yeah, so uh, let me let me just uh, get in there and, and uh, try to answer this up. So right now, uh, I mean, I know we are thinking about this as uh, COVID-19, uh, you know, and the pandemic and trying to get our kids back into school. So it's a great question. Uh, I, I would think that, you know, we always we, we would offer an introductory contract and, uh, you know, a lot is going to happen between now and a year from today. Uh, you know, as we get towards the end of the next year, of the upcoming school year, we can reevaluate and look at that. I would be uh, cautious to uh, the only you know the only thing I'd be nervous or con concerned about is if we just say it's a one year thing for a nurse. You know, we're probably asking someone to leave a hospital position or somewhere else. And if we just say it's a one year and get and that's it, I don't know if we'll fill it. I mean, that's I'm very concerned about filling these positions. Uh, I think it's going to be a very challenging time, and I think that. Uh, with the other 55 school, 54 school districts in Vermont. I don't know, I can't remember if it's 54 or 55. Uh, how many of them are gonna try to be hiring a, a COVID-19 coordinator in the next several weeks? And uh, which is why I'm very happy that we were able to help hold this meeting today. Um, so, yeah, so if there are nurses out there that are looking to get into schools, um, I don't know if I wanna I want say it's just a one year job, uh, but I think that you know, it's always based on performance. Uh, there's always attrition in, in the field of in the field, uh, so I don't want to just say that uh, it's a one year. I don't want to uh, pigeonhole ourselves or put us in the rabbit hole of saying it's a one year job when we may need that person to fill in for someone else who may retire or leave or uh, whatever happens between now and then. Lindy. Well, technically, anytime you're hired, it's just year to year because the budget has to pass and then the budget has to be. Put Together. So you may not be advertising it as one year, but whenever you take a job, you know that it could get cut or changed. So I don't think we have to make that decision now. That comes down to when we're budgeting for next year, determining this need was there and we need to keep it in the budget or not. Thanks, Cindy. Good point. Uh, Jonas. Um, would these, you know, if there's a point where the acute need for um, you know, a full FTE nurse in a school, if there's a time when that goes away, could these nurses also assist with something like health education, which I'm not sure is a significant part of the curriculum at a number of schools? Maria, I'd love to hear from you. Sure, so um, several schools have um, what's known as health teachers right, like PE teachers that have a health certification. Um, many schools don't, Doty does not. Um, Cal has just lost their health educator. Um, for myself, I'm pursuing a master's in nursing education, which covers the ability to get a teaching endorsement as well as a school nurse in endorsement. Um, and, and creating a health curriculum is actually something that we've been talking about on the school nurse level because we don't really have one at the moment at the elementary level. Um, so absolutely, especially in the smaller schools, while both the American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC and I mean, everybody and their mother say full-time school nurses are the way to go. Um, justifying that in a school of 80 kids is daunting in a regular year. And I certainly do understand that. Um, I think there is a myriad of ways that you can use school nurses in terms of education. Um, and I think this sounds like a dumb thing to say. It sounds a wee bit melodramatic, but I think it's on the right side of history to start moving towards more healthcare liaisons in schools, especially in these rural communities where kids have less access to healthcare than in um, an urban situation. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, am I on or not? Okay. Uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that might be a good idea because once they're certified teachers, they also could possibly work as uh, substitutes in a pinch. Um, 
and so they could do that as well. Hmm. Thank you. Um, this is Stephen, look. Um, I think these positions are a good example of potential benefits of the merger, um, where in the past it, it would have been, it would be good to have a full-time nurse in a school regardless of the size of the school, because the need of the nurse is when someone needs a nurse. Um, I understand this, you, you guys know me, I'm huge on data and statistics, but I think this is an opportunity where the costs can be shared across the entire district. And it, Chris, to kind of talk to what you may have alluded to, I'm not concerned about these potentially becoming full-time positions going forward. I think this is a shared expense that can be easily distributed amongst you know, our entire budget uh, and, and better serve some of the communities that have, a, you know, a need that they can't meet in the old model because they just didn't have the money. So um, I would be, I'm very comfortable voting to move them to one FTE and um, fully expecting that we, um, at the end of the year, have a discussion about continuing them as one FTE. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Um, any further, uh, Laurie, please. I just wanted to clarify that whenever we um, have a position that is approved off cycle and it's not in the budget, that we always issue a one-year contract to those individuals that doesn't automatically roll. And we always have that conversation um, in the fall when we begin the budget process for the future year. And I think you remember those conversations we had this year when we added a teacher um, at um, Callis. We had the conversation twice with the board. So we will be issuing one-year contracts. That's just the standard protocol for an off-cycle approval, unless you tell us differently. Right, and, and I don't hear us telling you differently at this point. Um, so, uh, ready for a vote then? Okay, I'm seeing nodding heads again. Um, all in favor of Marilyn's motion, seconded by Dorothy, to approve the additional uh, 1.0 FTE school nurse, um, please click yes, or if opposed, click no, or alternatively thumbs up or thumbs down. And once again, I'm, I'm seeing well, actually, not once again. For the first time, I'm seeing all green and thumbs up. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. The motion carries. Now, um, that takes care of 4.1 and 5.1 and 5.2. Now we're at 4.2, authorized central office safety renovations for COVID-19. Um, refer to page six of the board packet. So um, would... I don't know if you'd like to say anything about this, Brian. Oh, yeah. uh, what, do you, maybe we should make a, sorry, I'm, I'm so sorry. Maybe we should make a motion first to, um, a motion to approve and then, uh, and then discussion. So moved. Okay, uh, the, um, just to clarify, um, are, are you on page seven floor of the, of the packet? Yes, I'm, in, I'm um, on page seven, which is the one that I had questions about, but I'm uh, great. Ahead. Okay. <laughs> We're going to hit a move the. Do you mind reading the whole thing just so that the um, our viewing public can uh, can hear it? Yeah, authorized central office safety renovations for COVID-19. Um, and, and there's also there's also a recommended language for the motion on um, on page seven. I don't know if you have access to that where you are. Yeah, authorize the business, authorize the business administration and central office facility committee to complete the short-term renovations noted on one, two, three uh, above, along you know, examining long-term solutions for space shortage for central office. Okay. Um, 
Floor makes that motion. Lisa, you've got that, right? Great, okay. Um, is there a second? A second. Just one second, thank you very much. Thanks, Jonas. Um, uh, so uh, now, Brian. Yes, uh, this was something that was uh, mentioned to me uh, by the uh, former superintendent, and I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Lori to talk more about it because Lori has uh, been involved in this uh, project. Thank you very much. Go for it, right. So what I would like to start with is to just um, let people know that our office was designed by Black River uh, Design and it was actually constructed in 2009. Um, when that occurred, our front area was considered uh, two different ways, one of which was to have separate offices and have doors like the rest of the building, and the second was to have an open area. And so at the time, um, we had suggested that we have an open concept, um, but it was with an open concept that would not require much renovation should it need to be ever closed in. So in the past few weeks, Deborah and I have met with our Clerk of the Works, and so who's on the Central Office Facility Committee, that is our Clerk of the Works, Bill Ford, um, the Black River Design Architectural Firm, uh, Brian's on now, it was Deborah myself um, and Matt Kittredge, who represents our central office staff. And what they've done is taken a quick cursory look at our office and determined that it is true, it would not cost a lot of money to um, refurbish the front area to be offices like the rest of the building for the safety of the staff. And um, the second component was out back. We have people now in open areas that um, with the COVID um, would require some partitions we're looking at pricing right now and would have more information for the July 15th meeting for the finance committee and the board. Uh, but we just had wanted um, your authorization to continue on this manner because um, we're really nervous about reopening our office um, with all the social distancing requirements, knowing that we have four staff currently in very high risk areas. That was Thanks. all I had. I don't think I missed anything, but I just wanted to see if there's any questions. Thanks, Louie. Um, uh, so uh, at this point, there would be a second action that you would be looking for um, at, a, at a future board meeting to, I guess, uh, appropriate the funds for the actual work. Is that correct? Right now we would be, you know, basically this motion tonight would authorize us to continue with the architectural firm to get pricing, go out to bid and actually uh, get the ball rolling so that the finance committee could then hear the recommendations and the board would then approve it. I don't think we would have all that information on the 15th of July uh, because the process takes a little longer than that, uh, but we would definitely need to get this work done this summer in order for us to open safely in August, um, like all of the rest of our buildings. Great, uh, understood, thank you. Uh, Brian. Uh, Lori, uh, just uh, where where would uh, the funding be coming from for this? Uh, right. What are some funding sources? So at this time, um, we believe these types of uh, COVID-19 um, costs would be eligible for reimbursement out of next year's funds, uh, but we are awaiting how much money we would be appropriated. Um, we do not have that answer and will not have it until the legislature reconvenes, I think in August. Um, so it still remains to be seen whether we would need to somehow earmark funds from our budget, the capital fund, the fund balance, um, if we don't get sufficient funds. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Jaya? I'm wondering what our options are for um, remote work um, and if some of the folks in central office could continue to work remotely and uh, stagger their days just to save costs. Scott, wait, as uh, the question come up, I just want to follow protocol. Go right ahead, Lori. Okay, so we have been working remotely, but um, for instance, this week, um, we had the need to have eight out of 12 staff members in the office on a given day uh, because of the deadlines and the time constraints. Um, we're concerned that as school reopens, we're going to need to be in the office more. Um, we need to be there to support staff and to support questions from the community. 
and also to support our buildings. So while we're still trying to do the remote, it's becoming more and more apparent that we're gonna be back on site at probably full steam, just like the schools are when they reopen. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I wanna say on the first part in terms of the renovations, um, I'm strongly in support of, to the extent that we have to have staff in the building that we need to provide the partitions and the safety features that they need. And I, I think we should have a comprehensive approach to that as well, that we're looking at all our buildings, and all of our employees, um, administrators, teachers, and staff. And, and I'd like to be able to say that we've thought that through in, in, when the summer's over. But um, and I also want to express that I'm, I'm far more skeptical about the additions to the building. Um, you know, obviously we can take our time with that, but I, I would want to see why that would be a good investment, what would be the return on that investment, and how it fits into a longer term plan in terms of the number of administrators we're going to have in the future and remote working and all of that. So, thank you. Excellent point. Thank you, Kari. Stephen Luck, and then Floor. Um, so to echo what Kari said, I have absolutely no problem um, with renovations one and two. Um, number three, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't understand the need. I, I'm sure there's a need. I don't understand uh, the specificity of it. Um, and I'm just trying to couch very carefully what I say, but um, are our air circulation and air conditioning needs adequate in all our schools and classrooms? So now this is the end of what we're trying to do? Or, um, I mean, if we're, from my perspective, if we're going to spend money to improve health and safety, um, I'd like to make sure the students are taken care of um, with whatever finite funds we have. And again, I, I, I say things bluntly and I don't come across the right way. Um, I'm, I'm not a, a opposed, um, um, but a, a, to me, this isn't as high a priority as classrooms. And if the classroom air circulation is all fine and adequate, then I think it's appropriate we move to this. Ryan, do you mind I'm waiting until the floor has a chance to, oh. thank you. I'm sorry, I just didn't talk to that um, when I had my little summary. Um, what has happened is one of the front offices that would be closing in currently houses the air conditioning unit, which then means that it has to be relocated. So that's what number three means, um, that we do currently have an air conditioner in an area that would then become closed in. So it's not in the right spot. So it would need to be moved in a common area in the hallway there. In the back area, they found that the air circulation would work fine with those partitions. So there was no need to do any adjustment there. I apologize, I didn't bring that up. For, for my question, that, that adequately answered it, Scott. So I, I don't have any objections to any of the three. Okay, thank you very much, Stephen. Floor? I'm okay with letting Brian go go first. I, I have concerns with the motion as it's, uh, as it's drafted, but I'll let Brian speak and then I'll speak my mind. Sure, okay, Brian. Yeah, uh, and, I, and I think uh, Stephen uh, did bring up a, a very good point and uh, I'm glad he did about talking about air quality and air, that's always, I mean, in every district I've ever worked in, air quality is always a conversation. Uh, and just the way schools have been built, you know, you have, you have hundreds of children in a building and you're always trying to find ways to make sure the HVAC systems go through and cover, uh, cover make sure that it's circulating the correct way. Uh, that is actually something that I, I know that uh, uh, our, one of our task force, the facilities task force has been looking into uh, and uh, uh, the uh, chair did reach out to me today and uh, I'm looking forward to having more conversations with that chair and Bill Ford uh, in the near and immediate future, uh, possibly even as early as tomorrow. Uh, in regards to that, Stephen. So uh, I definitely think that is something we definitely want to look into. And uh, there may be some more information coming down the pike from, from me to this board about that, that particular topic. Thanks, Brian. Floor? 
So I'm I'm okay with number one. It, it is something that was planned before, and number uh, a number a number two, if it's being done with the long term. And now that uh, Laurie, uh, you know, sort of clarified who was on on that team, I I feel completely uh, relieved. Uh, I don't I agree with what Carrie and Stephen were saying. I, I don't think that this is the time to be because we've been wanting to look at all of our facilities as a whole as a finance committee and part of the idea of hiring Bill Four was to look at our schools as a full system and that everything that we've been doing is is long term uh, and possibly affects as many kids as possible. Yeah, health wise so I don't I don't see how we are gonna have to do some like temporary things and other schools and we invest more in central office I'm not saying that that is not important but I think there's ways to do it right now without having to get into a, the possible long term because we, we really have to look at all of our facilities a, a long term and look at it all of our like the efficiency study that we've been looking at, how we are going to be operating as a district to to make that commitment of money at this time when we know that our funds are going to be needed in so many in, in so many directions. Mm -hmm. So if and authorize, I would say that the motion is that authorized business administrator and central office. I, I think what we're what we're looking at is authorized to continue the process, and then you're coming back to us with. Prices and a, and a, and a, and, a, and a bid. We're not out there. I, I don't feel comfortable authorizing the work being done right now, just because we don't know what the cost. You know, we're just we're authorizing the process to continue. Is how I feel comfortable. Yeah, and, and that's that's I think how Laurie was explaining it too earlier. Um, should we? Uh, Those guys. Then we should amend the language because it says authorized to complete um, the short term renovations. And so the language would not indicate just complete the process, it would complete the project. So I would offer a friendly amendment um, to the motion uh, that we authorize um, to complete the process um, of exploring short term renovations. Um, Floor, you made the motion. Do you accept that friendly amendment? I, I accept the, the the friendly. I accept the friendly amendment. So, can you repeat it, uh, Chris? Just for yes, and author. So, authorize the business administrator and central office facility committee to complete the process um, of exploring the short term renovations noted in one, two, and three above. Period. Do we want to continue on with long-term examination of um, shortage, space shortage issues, or no? Because that sounded like that that was. Um, you want to you really want to cut that one off? <clears throat> okay. So, as I recall, Flora, you were the you made the motion, and Chris, you you were the second, or or were were you the second judge? I seconded it. Yes, you seconded it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if the two of you are, are okay with that friendly amendment, Floor? So one one last question, Lori, just for, for process. Uh, wouldn't wouldn't Brian be you are on the on the facility committee. Wouldn't Brian be ultimately the person responsible for uh, for the district and the renovations? And you're part of the facility you're already part of the facility committee. So it should be up to Brian, not the business administrator. It, not to take anything away from you, but it should ultimately, the bill is gonna come up to him. So I think it should be Brian, not. Yeah. I agree, Deborah wrote it, I didn't. <laughs> that's just- so Authorize the superintendent. As we get started, he's our superintendent, so that's- Thank you. Yeah, Deborah wrote it with oh. one foot already out the door, I think. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, are, are we are we good on that, Lisa? Uh, oh, sorry, Linda, uh, Lindy, pardon me. Um, I was a little concerned because when the building was built, it already provided personal offices, you know, one person with a door. And the front, in order to be um, welcoming, even if right now we're not welcoming people, should not be closed in, walled in, but plexiglass of some sort because they're already well over six feet apart. If you're out in the common area with your masks on and um, plexiglass partitions in the open area, 
meet the standards that are being required. Uh, and we're going to have, you know, schools with children in areas much more compact. And I just feel that the cost and the work should be minimal since that office is already not a free flow open kind of office. People have their own space, they have doors, they have windows and fresh air is one of the things they say is much better than circulated air. Um, so I would be pretty um, conservative and looking at what others places have done with plexiglass in order to not have droplets flying all over people. Um, so I, I just want you to know that the conservative, for me, that office building was already built very privately where people have their individual offices. Thanks, Lindy. Um, before we proceed, Lisa, I just wanted to make sure that, um, that you were clear on the motion as it has been amended in friendly fashion. Okay, so the amended motion reads, floor move to authorize the superintendent, wait, to authorize the superintendent to authorize completing the process. That doesn't make sense. Authorize the superintendent to, to or, or to um, the process. Pursue the pro. It, it's not complete the process. It's sort of to continue the process. Continue the process. Thank you. To continue the process of exploring short-term renovations noted in numbers one, two, and three, as delineated in the July first memo from the superintendent. Ooh, nice. Yeah. Um, and then period. Correct. Yes. Nothing okay. About, nothing about long-term. Whatever. Right. Is that the understanding, Flora and Chris? Okay. Um, uh, any, any, Diane? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate the amendment because that was the biggest concern of, of granting approval of something that we don't know, um, financially what, what the recommendation would be. Um, and I guess as, you know, as a community member, when that building was built, it was, really touted to us all as cutting edge, green, sustainable. And I know that there's been a lot, there have been several situations of modif modifying it, but I think we just, we have to be clear that whatever modifications, while it is connected to COVID, I think we need to be responsible and responsive to our community that voted that building in originally um, and explaining what those renovations have been and why those renovations have occurred. Good point. Thank you, Diane. Um, other other um, questions, discussion on this motion, or are we ready to vote? I'm not seeing nodding, um, except for Kari. Oh, good, good. All right. Um, in that case, all in favor of the motion to authorize the superintendent to continue exploring short-term renovations noted in one, two, and three above, period. Um, please vote, uh, if you vote yes, click the green button and no, the red button, uh, or a thumbs up, as the case may be. And I'm seeing all green and thumbs up. So the motion carries. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, that brings us to 4.3, Finance Committee meetings. Um, Flora, did you want to? Um, sure. The question was: it was it is it helpful for the administrators to have, especially if we're going to be looking at things like that, to have a finance committee? We don't. We did not have a finance committee meeting schedule until our next uh, and our next meeting, uh, which is uh, which is sooner because we were not having this meeting, Jeffrey team. So I just it, the, the question was: Do you need the support of the finance committee in order to move to do? Uh, anything that was. Um, uh, does uh, Fleur, does Brian know who is on the finance committee? I am not, I, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's... Possibly not. And this is a test of ours too. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Uh, so, and, uh, yes. and I guess uh, my question is, uh, the Finance Committee uh, is an informational committee that takes information back to the board. Uh, they do not have um, any uh, information to act. They don't actually make decisions, right? They, that committee actually gets the information and takes it back, correct? Bring, yeah, brings recommendations to the board. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, isn't there some limited authority though? On a case by case basis, if the board yeah. authorizes the finance committee to. So that was, the or... so that, that is really the question. Is, is there a need for the board as you move, as we move ahead? And, and I guess the people on, that are on the finance committee could, you know, raise their hand in there <laughs> so that Brian gets an idea of who's in that. <laughs> Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so, and that's, a, and I think that's a great, I'm sorry. Chris, were you, were you trying no, to no, ask no, a question? No, no. Okay. Sorry, Brian, continue, please. Oh, oh no, and I, and I think that's a, and, and that's a question for the board, uh, because, uh, you know, one of the things is, you know, I will tell you that, uh, you know, one of the big projects uh, next week is to, sit down with my leadership team and my central office administration and start looking through the laundry list of asks and uh, ideas that are coming out of these five task forces. Uh, there is a lot of information that, that's coming out. I, I, mean, it, it is, I can fill a book with, with the information that's coming out on that with those five task forces. And uh, some of those things are gonna require money, right? Like, uh, you know, and decisions. And so I think that uh, do we need, some of that's going to cost money. Some of that will be possibly less than the threshold where I need to ask the board for, for permission, uh, but more likely letting the board know that, hey, here's money that we need to spend. And we probably need to do some of these quick, more quickly than others because I'm anticipating that um, the rest of Vermont and the rest of the country is going to start buying a lot of these types of things as well, all at the same time as everyone's trying to reopen their schools. And so, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not trying to rush. I'm not trying to... Uh, um, you know, push us into a corner where we have to start making decisions and board by it. But we, if we are serious about reopening school uh, in the uh, fall, then we are going to start having to buy certain things to make sure that the adults and children are safe. And so I guess the big essential question for the board is uh, if I, if we need to spend several thousand dollars on, on items, uh, how does the board wish to be informed? How does the board wish to uh, make that decision if it's something that is higher than my than the $15,000 threshold for certain items. Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, if the finance committee, uh, are finance committee members planning on going anywhere out of Zoom range in the next few weeks in case we need to be called in um, sort of mm -hmm. on the spot, no? Okay, so we'll just be standing by in case of need. Um, and then the board, the next regular board meeting is the 15th anyway. So um, the finance committee, if we met before that, um, which we're scheduled to meet uh, uh, anyway, right, Fleur, on the 15th. So if we, then we can, we can make re recommendations and whatever else. Stephen. Understanding all of this, um, so this is directed probably mostly at Brian. Um, I appreciate the the speed and the and the agility that we need to to work with. I'm not trying to um, constrain that, um, but also um, as as much as possible, I would expect as comprehensive a request as possible. Um, what I don't want to be put in the position of on July 15th, say we need. X dollars to do this, this, and this. And then a week later, we need X dollars to do this, this, and this. And then two weeks later, oh, this is something that now is the top priority. And it's like, well, if I'd known that two weeks ago, it would have informed my earlier decisions. So I, I hate to be putting pressure on you on the, but that's an ask as for me as a board member, as much as practical, if the executive and the leadership team can be as comprehensive as they can in their request. That helps 
me as a board member decide where the priorities are and where the money should most importantly be spent. Amen. Well said, Stephen. Thank you. Um, Brian, please. And uh, and Stephen, I well, I can just tell you that uh, the way I operate, I operate is I try to be as comprehensive as possible with the information that I have give that I have in my hand at that time. Uh, and I will say that uh, it, I'm hoping that I'll have as much information as possible at the July 15th meeting. Uh, I'm not sure what the AOE and my team and I, my central central office team and my leadership team will be meeting regularly about these items. Uh, rest of this week, next week, and beyond. I will say though that if the AOE comes out or the CDC comes up with these other ideas that we haven't thought of, and you know, it, it does require additional types of items that we haven't thought of yet, uh, I will definitely have to uh, come back to the board, but please know that I'm definitely trying to work to be as comprehensive as possible, because I know that uh, as a board member, your job is extremely difficult uh, to begin with, and when folks start coming in, just piecemealing things together, that's not the way we really want to do business. Stephen. And now to the finance committee, perhaps, if, if there is a meeting in, in, in between now and our July meeting. Um, I, I really personally, as a board member, want to be able to extend maximum flexibility to our administrators when it comes to personal protective type, if, um, you know, if, if the Vermont Department of Health says these kind of masks are needed and these kind of shields, that kind of thing, I, I, I want to extend the maximum uh, ability to let the superintendent and executive committee move on items like that. It's not anything we need to vote on tonight, but executive for the finance committee, if there can be some kind of a recommendation around personal protective equipment, I think that's an area where, at least for me as a board member, I would be very comfortable um, extending very lenient um, uh, permissions to purchase. Because that, that mean to me that's a kind of a non-debatable kind of a thing. We're we're going to get the protection we're required to get. So uh, maybe the finance committee could chew on how to come up with some kind of recommendation around that thought. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. I know Fleur heard you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with you, Stephen. And uh, I I would like to propose that the finance committee meets, yeah, but we can do this. Uh, separate from this meeting but meets before the 15 because it's hard to digest everything right before the meeting it would be better if we had two meetings uh, one before the 15 and one on the 15 so to make sure that our recommendations are clear great thank you Flora. um lindy i think just like everything else that's unprecedented or weird or odd the fact that we haven't normally met in summers just has to be forgotten because in this case in order to make sure schools start if they need you know if the administration needs our approval or our it makes sense to call special meetings as needed i'm not saying like every night or something but i just want brian to know that support is there even though it hasn't been the practice for us to meet during the summers because things run smooth but right now, people right are so concerned about how the year is going to start as families. If kids aren't in school and I'm working or blah, 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 how is this all going to work? Or if kids are only in school Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So in order to help facilitate some of that, um, I just wanted to say, I think it makes sense. We can't go anywhere anyway. And by Zoom, we could do it if we could go somewhere. So. <laughs> yeah, um, that's great, Lindy. Uh, I think, um, I don't uh, know that anybody on the board will uh, say anything against what you just said. On the contrary, I think uh, I, very well spoken. Um, so anyway, if we're ready to move on, um, we're done then with 4.0 uh, 4 and 5.0, 6.0 future agenda items. I wonder, um, Marilyn, may I uh, give you the floor? Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to um, 
let you all know that I'm resigning my pitch position tonight. Um, my family and I are moving to Massachusetts. Um, it's a really hard decision to take them and move them to an epicenter, um, but they need to be able to access the education and, and they're not able to do that here. Um, I hope, I, I really hope that you understand and listen to me now as a, as a parent, um, that you need to look at our data that we've been looking at in the CIP and what's been brought forth as concerning data. Look at the article that I sent you today and look at the problem with our special education. Um, my daughter was accepted into a language-based program and she's not getting any services here. So um, please continue to have the conversation, Kari. Um, I, I really hold a lot of faith in you and the, the Education Quality Committee. I'm so happy that you're here. You said in our last meeting, which was the only one that I could come to, um, maybe we should take a step back from liter looking at our literacy. Please don't, Kari. Um, and I don't often, boost up the agency of education, but Dan French is a wealth of information and please pay attention to that, okay? Um, thank you so much. I, I definitely wanna make sure you all know that I was on the board before their diagnosis and I stayed on the board because someone needed to have the voice of the children that don't get to access the education that most of the kids here do. Um, it's always been my intent to have all of our children's interests. That's why I'm on the SEAC. That's why I lobbied Congre Congress, you know, January, February, March, all those days I quit my job to, to really work on the literacy here. Um, so please take this seriously and know that I'm not the only parent. I'm just lucky enough to have the resources to be able to make the move that I need for them. But I love you guys. You're doing such a great job as a board. Um, I'm so happy with all the additions. Um, and I, I wish you all the best of luck. And Brian, I'm so upset that I'm not going to be working with you because I'm so excited you're from Jersey. Um, but I, I really appreciate that you're here. And I, I'm so looking forward to what you can bring to the board. So welcome and, and thank you for your time. Thanks, Marilyn. Thank Marilyn. We'll, yeah. we'll miss you tremendously. And, and if I can sort of give you at least some uh, small reassurance that at least in my case, my experience of working with you over this past year has impressed indelibly on my brain and, and heart, um, you know, the, the passion and the intensity with which, and the, and the righteousness with which you've been pursuing this. So um, just because you're leaving doesn't mean that we'll, um, we'll drop this. Um, I, I hope that we'll be able together to, to follow through and, um, and really help everyone who needs it. Um, but thank you, Marilyn. I know this was so hard for you to do with everything else going on and you've done brilliantly. And again, we'll miss you tremendously. Thanks, I miss you guys too. Um, so uh, that has one rather major future agenda item is um, finding someone to fill uh, some pretty gigantic shoes. You'd um, be shocked to hear that I'm, I'm on top of that. Um, so I'm hoping there'll be some people heading your way. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, uh, are there uh, other other future agenda items? I hope nothing quite so um, earth shaking. Lindy. Well, I forwarded to the rest of the board the email from Alex Ravakis about the solar opportunity for the credits toward. I believe it's Berlin and East Montpelier are the only two schools that are Washington Electric co-op schools, and it is a very easy um system it's very well known he's uh, putting in a, 
a big solar array in Williamstown and has to appoint, uh, portion those credits. And he approached us and I sent it out with all the information in it. And I think it would um, be very smart for us to take action on this at the July 15 meeting. He can be there, I believe, to speak to it if we need him to. Um, it's, it's a few thousand dollars a year for the schools who get the credits. And if that's all it is, we just get, and otherwise he'll go somewhere else. Um, but he lives in the district and he would, well, I don't know that, I just said that, I don't know that's true. But he wants us to take advantage of these credits. And I think we should. He had emailed us earlier in the year, it kind of got lost. And then Tony Klein called. We had a very long chat as is usual with Tony Klein. And then, um, Alex reached out with the specific in the email, which I did forward to everybody. So I would like that on our next um, agenda. Thank you, Lindy. Um, is this uh, Stephen? Did you want to comment on Lindy's, or did you have another one? That yeah, you no, I, I think it's fine. It's on a future agenda item. But I, I, I talked to this at the last um, energy situation. Um, I, I strongly believe the board should not be negotiating these kind of contracts. So this needs to go to whatever administrator is responsible for it. And we would ask that a motion, um, an action motion be brought to our next mo the next board meeting. I, I, I don't wanna sit through another session where we're negotiating with some provider on what the contract is and all that. I, I'm not saying it's not a great idea, it's just procedural. So I guess Brian and Lindy, if wherever that information needs to go for some administrator to evaluate it and make a recommendation, we recommend that you accept this contract or you don't accept this contract, then it can go on the next board meeting. We get it in our packet, we read about it, yeah. Uh, as Lindy said, this is a great idea. It's recommended by whoever. Uh, yeah, I approve it. Um, yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Stephen. You um, you stole what little thunder I <laughs> had to offer. Um, the my question would be whether it could be um, whether the uh, Lori and the central office, whoever would be involved in this, would have the time to staff this for the finance committee. Um, before it came to the board, so that um, that would be sort of my does that does that fit with your understanding of how this that's how we did Robbie's thing, wasn't it, Floor? Uh, yeah, that's how we did Robbie's thing. And then one one comment about this, Lindy, is that uh, Alex did reach out to Scott early on, and Scott copied us, and I think what got uh, lost is really that we've been looking at having a coordinator because there were a lot of different solar providers that were looking to doing, his is a little different, the way that he's explaining it now is completely different to where, at the first conversation we had with him. But uh, in having a, a Bill Ford be part of this conversation, and he felt that we didn't have the bandwidth right now, it's sort of similar to what Scott is saying. And so, so we just need to be careful of how we task our administrators. And I know that it is uh, savings, but it, it just, you know, make sure what our priorities are at, uh, at the moment. Um, I, Dorothy? I'd like to be involved in whatever people meet about this. I have some extensive information uh, regarding it, and I think I would be a benefit. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, I've taken note. Thanks. Um, uh, are we good with this? Shall we, are there other um, future agenda items that uh, specifically, if possible, for July 15, Chris? Um, so I, was, I would propose that we start our search for our next um, business manager as soon as possible so that, um, if possible, there can be an extended overlap with Lori Bebo, who knows where all the bodies are buried, and she can unearth them for our new, admin, our new business manager. Yes, sorry for bursting with laughter on a microphone. Um, I... That's a great idea, Chris. That's a serious, that is a serious request. I, I know it's a serious request. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
it, uh, this is a, an extremely important one. I, I completely agree. Um, so, uh, are there other are there others? We have um, uh, filling the middle sex an open position, sadly open position in the middle sex. We have the um, energy, uh, solar energy. Uh, yes, and then. Um, uh, and overlap the succession in the business administrator position. And Jonas, sorry. I'd just like to let us not to forget that we are also down a member in Worcester. And we're down a member in Worcester. Thank you again for reminding me. Yeah, this we need to, we need to fix. Um, uh, other future agenda items, or are we ready to, um, to stay Good night to each other. Uh, sorry, Brian. Uh, yes, uh, I, I mean, I, I think the other, another agenda, I don't, I, it, it will, do you want to talk about the board retreat at the next? Uh... Oh yeah, most definitely. Okay. Yes, thank you. Excuse me, Scott? Yes, um, where is that okay. coming from? This is Corinne. Oh, Corinne, um, hi. I've, I've been here all along. Um, I just wanted to clarify, I'm not, I'm not positive from what I'm hearing if it will be at the July 15th meeting where there will be some more clarity as far as what parents can expect the fall to look like. Um, I, know that, I know that for some people, it's gonna make a difference as far as whether they're going to feel comfortable sending their kids in and I'm just wondering how much lead time they're really going to have to to grapple with what they can really expect. Understand. Thank you, Corinne. Brian, would you like to field or, or, uh, or did I see Casey raising your hand? Um, Casey. Sure. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I know that the second meeting of the month is when uh, the full administrative team is planning to join the meeting. So. Um, we also give a report at the second meeting. So we have all of our five task forces are, are working once or twice weekly. So we would be happy to give a more thorough and detailed update at the of our current thinking uh, two weeks from now. Okay, thank you, Casey. Thanks. Uh, Diane? One of the things to keep in mind is I believe, um, and this might be why Corinne's asking, is I think August 1st is the deadline for families who want to put in a plan for homeschooling. And so that I hadn't realized that until she said that, how that connects with whether what we inform our families as to what the planning is and the thinking. So just, just to put that date out there as people are making those conversations. Well uh, thank, oh, Corinne, um, I think Brian might actually have something to add to that. Yeah, oh, and, and could, I, could I? Okay. Well, uh, I was just going to say, to me, I wasn't just thinking about if people might choose to homeschool, but I'm still not clear from what I'm hearing if, if you know, I don't know whether you're looking at having all kids back at school on what we used to consider a normal schedule or if there'll be a hybrid model or, or what there could potentially be but i can't tell from what i'm hearing if it's really an option for a parent to keep their kid at home and not be homeschooling you know to do some type of online learning directly connected with the school as opposed to needing to move off to do either homeschooling or to another school or whatever their comfort level is. Right, thanks Corinne. Brian um, has an answer, I think. Uh, uh, well, I don't know how to add the, the answer completely, but uh, I, can, I can tell you that uh, you know, one of the purposes today, Corinne, was to just let the Board of Ed and the community know that our leadership team uh, and our district team, everyone is really looking at this and taking this very seriously about what the safest way is to reopen school. Uh, there, uh, I, I kind of want to get away from the word, the term homeschooling, because that was kind of a pre-COVID-19 um, uh, term. I would really move, rather talk about remote learning, uh, and uh, and I and I think that's why we're also looking to develop our capacity in that area uh, of uh, remote learning. Because I know uh, there's a gentleman in the beginning of the night who talked about, um, uh, you know, he doesn't want to send his kids to school because in the middle of the pandemic. 
and you know what are the options? And so one of the options that we're looking at right now is uh, how many families are, do not plan on sending their kids to school, and how many uh, how how many how many teachers do we have to uh, assign to doing remote learning? Because uh, I think remote learning is uh, going to have to be something as part of one of our reopening plans. Brian, then we're not quite understanding each other because to me, there's a vast difference between remote learning and homeschooling. I did homeschool some of my kids. Mm -hmm. And so homeschooling to me has a different meaning than remote learning. Yes, yes, uh, I understand that. I just wanted to uh, clarify that there are some people that are using it synonymously, I'm not saying that you are, uh, that, but that the, uh, the idea is we really want to make sure we offer a remote learning opportunity for students. So it's not necessarily a homeschooling. So, so we have a, I'm just making numbers up here because I don't have the numbers in front of me and I don't know what the answer, what the numbers are currently, but let's say if there are 30 families that don't want to uh, send their kids to the school uh, next year, well, if we can identify those and that's something that our leadership team is talking about, how to go about and identifying those families who don't feel comfortable sending their kids back uh, at the uh, in the start at the start of the year, uh, well, well, uh, may, then we we should have some sort of remote learning opportunity for them uh, that will be offered by our district. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Corinne, and thank you, Brian. I, I think what this shows is that the present agenda item will also be a future agenda item. So. And so just quickly, as the gentleman from the beginning of the call who indicated that, I want to say, it yes. when I first heard this talk of homeschooling and kind of indicating, hey, you're going to be on your own, file your paperwork with the DOE and do your own thing, uh, that was not appealing to me. I always imagined that whatever was going to happen, we'd still be a part of the regular Romney system, and we don't want it to be different than that. We want remote learning, not homeschooling. Okay, um, David, I don't know if you can see Brian raising his I, I turned do. thumb. Oh, good, good, okay. Um, so, uh, if there's no objection, it's 8.32. We've uh, overshot, uh, which I'm sure comes as a shock to everyone. But um, Marilyn, uh, very, very best. Um, thank you. And Brian, once again, welcome. May this be the start of a beautiful friendship. And um, every, everybody else, please have a great 4th of July weekend. Yes. And see you next time. Great. Thank you. Thank you for your support today. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. And we adjourn at 832.